Hey guys and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Phil Richards. In today's video we're going to be taking you through all you need to get started with observation of the hip joint. We're going to be breaking the observation down into an anterior, a posterior and a lateral view. We're going to be highlighting key traits and pathologies such as osteoarthritis or greater trochanteric pain syndrome. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing the affected hip and the unaffected hip, but of course in practice we always want you to compare the left and right to inform your patient diagnosis. A quick word on patient dignity. As part of a routine observation, we would hope that the patient would be able to get down to shorts or if they're comfortable, underwear, so we can at least view the anterior and the lateral thigh and the low back. Unless it is clinically justified, we would not routinely look at areas such as the inguinal ligament or the buttock unless it's indicated in the patient history. If it is indicated, of course, get informed consent and explain to the patient why you're doing it. In terms of general observation, we still need to consider inflammatory signs and bony deformity. In case you've forgotten, your three key inflammatory signs are redness, swelling, and bruising. Right, that's it. Let's get to our main video. Let's get clinical. So there are five key presentations in which you are highly likely to find inflammatory signs that every good clinician should be aware of. Number one is a trauma. With any trauma, your patient may suffer bony or soft tissue injury, such as a fracture or a ruptured muscle. Expect to find either swelling, bruising or deformity when observing the joint. For more severe cases, you may find more than one of these signs present. Number two is a bursitis which put simply is inflammation of a bursa. Some bursae are more easily seen when they are inflamed. For instance, elecronon bursitis, or student's elbow, can be easily visualized as the bursa is right beneath the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Others are not so easily visualized due to their anatomy. For instance, subacromial bursitis, where the bursa in question lies in a relatively deep position underneath the acromion. The amount of swelling seen therefore varies based on the anatomical site and the severity of inflammation. In the event of a bursitis, you may see redness on the skin and feel warmth on palpation. Always consider whether this could have been caused mechanically or whether an infection is responsible, in which case your patient may be systemically unwell. Number three is a tendonitis. When you look at the tendon in question, your patient may get swelling and redness in the most severe forms. Be aware though, don't rule out tendonitis if these signs are not present. You should also rely on your objectives, tests and mechanical signs. Number four is an infection or a cellulitis, where you may find redness or swelling, or in progressed cases even pus in the area of infection. Furthermore, look at your patient as a whole. Do they feel unwell? or do they have a temperature? Finally, number five is arthropathies, which can be categorized into osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and crystal arthritis. For osteoarthritis, you may expect to find an enlarged swollen joint, and in progressed cases, you may find hard swelling when you palpate the joint. With rheumatoid arthritis, you may find redness or swelling at the joint you are assessing, as well as other joints, particularly the hands and the feet. The onset of rheumatoid arthritis is insidious, so if your patient history indicates an absence of trauma, this should be considered a potential pathology. If you suspect this condition, you may wish to liaise with your patient's GP to conduct blood tests to rule out raised inflammatory markers. Crystal arthropathies represent a group of conditions associated with the deposition of mineralized material, mimicking crystals within joints and surrounding tissues. Gout and pseudogout are some of the most recognizable forms. These conditions present typically in a single large joint with redness and swelling and may well be warm to palpate. Like with rheumatoid arthritis, the important things to bear in mind are whether or not the onset of symptoms can be linked to a mechanical cause and whether mechanical aggravating or easing factors can be associated with the patient's symptoms. If not, a crystal arthropathy should be considered and the patient should consult with their GP for further investigation. So those are our inflammatory signs. Let's get into the main video. So now we're going to look at hip observation uh, in a standing position. We're going to start with the anterior view. So we're going to do an anterior, a lateral and posterior view. 
So the first thing you want to do is just do a global scan and just see if anything immediately stands out for you. Are they putting too much weight on one leg, the other? Is one shoulder really raised? Anything that would br bring up suspicion immediately. And then the key things after that we're going to look at is the hip in relation to the knee and the ankle. And there's two main things we're going to look out for. One is a very valgus knee, which is going to be associated likely with a pronated foot. And this may be on both sides. You know, hopefully you can see on the camera anyway that even though Polly tried to force herself into that position, she naturally sits into that position anyway. So if we get you to relax, you can probably still see from that view that that's, that's her setup. So the reason that's important in relation to hip pathology is it means that we've got a longer distance for the ITB and the tissues coming down this way. And it means that often, but not always, we need to look at our other testing that the gluteal muscles around the hip are going to be dysfunctional and potentially weak. You can see this kind of behavior in people that have really ridiculously weak glutes when they try and do a sit to stand and the knees come together in that very valgus position. So that's the first one. The second one is that the, we might have a varus position more. So hopefully you can see Paul's trying to do that for us here. So the weight bearings on the outside of the foot more. We've got a pes cavus position here. This can also affect the hip because this recruits very much more of the lateral tissue uh, and it can be overactive on the glutes. Um, so again, we'll have a glute dysfunction, but in a different way. So what we're saying is if you go too far in, pronating and uh, valgus, or too far out, you're likely to cause dysfunction at the glutes, which may be related to your patient's uh, presenting condition at the hip. So now let's look at the lateral view. So the key thing we're looking for in the lateral view is the relative anterior or posterior tilt in the pelvis. So an anterior tilt being excessively this way and posterior coming back this way. And the most common one we're looking for is the anterior tilt. And you can relax there, Paul, because that's quite horrible to hold. So why is this important? Well, there's quite a few reasons. So this abnormal position here will tighten the QLs or make them dysfunctional. It's going to tighten the hip flexors and it's likely to cause spinal compression here. So because we're talking about it in relation to hip problems, um, it's not that it's purely compressing the spine that's a problem, it's that there's an abnormal vector of force traveling from the lower limbs through the body. They shouldn't feel the pressure there, which means that the forces aren't going to be working well. That means, what most commonly means, is it's gonna bypass the glutes. So by the time someone anteriorly tilts and they start running and jumping and moving, the force is going to travel up the glutes aren't really going to be involved and it's going to start compressing into the lumbar spine. It means that the activity all around the hip is going to change and become dysfunctional. So it's not just about that compression at the lumbar spine. Conversely, if they're too posteriorly tilted here, then the glutes are always going to be in a relatively shortened position and we're not likely to have a normal natural flow of that anterior posterior tilt as they go through their walking cycle or their movements. So that can be dysfunctional. So in the same way that we saw in the anterior view that two valgus varus can be bad for the hip, two anteriorly rotated or two posteriorly rotated can also be bad for the hip. So now we're going to look at the hips in the posterior view. So we're always looking for a sense of symmetry really with, with observation. So we're going to start maybe at the knee creases here, see if they're level, the gluteal folds and, and the hips here. So the PSIS sort of level. And the main thing we're looking for in this, uh, this view is whether the hips are hiking or dropping. So that would be a frontal plane issue where one hip is sort of up or left or right. And it makes sense that that would put abnormal forces through, through the hip and the lower limb. Um, again, with potential spinal compression. So what this means is, if you think about it, if we tilted pole up to this side, it means that the glute tissue on this side is going to be more stretched out and the tissue on this side is going to be relatively contracted. So when pole then starts to move around, lunge, move as she needs to do in sport or just whatever she does in the world, it means that this hip may not actually be able to shift out as much anymore because it's gone so tight that could be causing problems. Or this one's got so used to being loose 
that she's just constantly falling into that, stretching it out. And then lo and behold, we end up with a trochanteric pain syndrome or an irritable piriformis that's trying to grip and control and something like that. So hopefully you can see that excessively being asymmetric one way or the other is going to be detrimental to the hip. And so now we're going to complete our hip observation in the anterior view with the patient supine. So we'll have previously had a look at the hip in standing and seen what's happening there, but this close-up gives us an opportunity to check for our bony deformity and inflammatory signs. If they're reported in the patient history or just the area of pain, you can ask your patient if you're allowed to look at that area because obviously it's a sensitive area. You're going to need to get permission first. So we're just going to have a quick look and we can see if things look symmetrical, things are rotated and whatnot, but it's our inflammatory signs and bony deformity we're most interested in in this position. So let's summarize this video on observation of the hip joint. In standing, break down your observation of the hip into an anterior, lateral and posterior view before bringing your patient into a supine position and observing the joint in the anterior view. Remember to compare both affected and unaffected sides. When observing your patient, look for deformity and inflammatory signs, which are redness, swelling, and bruising. You can also look for signs of specific pathology in each view, as mentioned throughout the video. And that concludes our video of observation of the hip joint. From here, we'd suggest you check out other videos in the clinical physio catalogue, such as active range of motion testing of the hip and passive range of motion testing of the hip. Guys, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again soon on Clinical Physio.